Today on Fight to Win, I've got some exciting things for you. We're beginning Financial Keys Week, and we're going to be talking about, is it Bible to tithe in the New Testament? You're going to, not going to want to miss this. Also, we've got a free offer this week, uh, our Financial Keys book that we want to give to you absolutely free. And also, in our tactical tip, we're going to start doing gear reviews, and I want to talk to you about a knife that will help you, even if you've never had any knife training at all. To succeed in life, we have to fight. That's why winners train spirit, soul, and body. We have to be ready. Not your typical minister, Kurt Owen left a successful career in private investigation and executive protection for the ministry over 20 years ago. His simple, practical application of God's Word will reveal how much Jesus loves you and give you the ability to fight to win. Now, get ready for a tactical tip from Pastor Kurt. Hello, I'm Kurt Owen. Today on Tactical Tips, we're going to be doing a gear review. Just so it's clear on, in any of our gear reviews, uh, none of the ones I'm going to be showing you lately are going to, nobody's provided me anything, right? Nobody's given it to me to review. I purchased everything. In, if you're watching this show and say, hey, I'd like to have him review my stuff, you're welcome to send it, but understand if your stuff sucks, I'm going to tell it, okay? Because uh, I'm not going to lie to people just because you send me something for free. Um, this is a palm knife. I'm a firm believer in palm knives for people that, especially if you don't know how to use knives. Uh, my wife has a palm knife. Uh, my babysitter has a palm knife for my daughter. But this is probably one of my favorite. And when I first got it, I actually hated it. It's by TKL Knives. And it was designed by a buddy of mine named Steve Tarani. You can see his name right there, Tarani. Uh, and you can see over here the TKL, right? Now, this is the Yoradoshi, I think. Uh, it's a tri-point. Uh, it's basically a tanto, a thick tanto-bladed palm knife. And the reason that I hated it was when I first got it, I was used to just a regular palm knife where I would punch with it. See, here's the thing about palm knives, right? So if you do not have, if you don't have any knife skill, you can put it together. I normally recommend people put it in their offhand, right, as a force multiplier because you're used to using this and you can use it. I like them. They're... Uh, because you can punch but when Steve designed this knife something that was brilliant because that's normally how you would hold a palm knife he made it so that you could actually turn this put your thumb in and now if I actually have some expertise with knives I can actually use it for cutting and for slashing whereas this would be awkward right this is is very in line with what I do so it's a very cleverly designed knife I really really like it it's not cheap but it is good comes with an angular uh, scabbard fits right on your belt that's the TKL Tarani uh, Tanto Palm Knife hello I'm Kurt Owen welcome back to fight to win there are some really exciting things I'm going to share with you this week listen I've been traveling around. Everybody's dealing with something financially. Uh, I mean, it, let's just be honest. When you go to the gas pump, and thank God, it, it's crazy when we're sitting there saying, yeah, gas is only three forty-three a gallon. I mean, that's, that's wild, right? But it, I don't know about you, but I think at one point we were paying five maybe, I think, close to it. So every time you go into the gas pump, you have right in your face some of the stuff that's going on in the United States and truly around the world. And I want to begin to put some word into you so that you are conducting yourself in faith and not in fear. That you are actually trusting God in these things. That you are uh, releasing your faith and, and really giving you something to hold on to. Now, I also have to be honest, we're going to be covering some things that lately, for whatever reason, has become almost controversial and that's about tithing and I want to start from the jump just to say this unless you're a minister unless you're a church or a corporation I do not want you sending your tithes into Colonel and Ministries now those other things what do you say what how do those others differ well if you're a minister and this is the way you receive your feeding um, we do you know my wife and I do tithe to our local church where she pastors but on the other side of it we also make sure there's the larger portion of our tithe goes into other ministries. Why? Because we, we have to bless those who are feeding us and feeding our ministry gifts. 
And so if you're a minister and this is feeding you and you're sending, we'll, we'll accept a portion of your tithes or your tithes. If you're a corporation and you're the head of the corporation and your personal tithes are going to your local church, but you, your company should tithe, we'll receive that. If, um, what was the other one? Uh, tithe, corporations, ministers, uh, churches, you know, a lot of times when we're feeding the pastor of the church, the tithe, the, the churches themselves will tithe and send it in here. In those instances, but listen, the majority of your tithes should be going to where you're fed most, and that should be your local church. And so we're here at KOM, we're a friend to the local church, we're a friend to pastors. But tithing is kind of underneath an attack because, um, People are now saying you don't have to tithe because we're not under the law, we're under grace. And, and now it's, and honestly, this has gone around for years. It kind of cycles, I don't know, every 10 or 15 years, I guess. But we need to deal with this. We need to actually look at what the Word says and not allow any doctrine to determine what we're doing, but let the Word do it. And now I'm, I'm in a kind of an interesting position as far as my own spiritual walk, right? Um, I got saved under watching Brother Copeland on television, right? I was, now up to that point, I, I guess I'd had some other people witness to me, but really it was listening to him on television and him tell, making the statement, the Bible is God speaking to you. If you believe it, it'll work for you. If you don't, it won't. It, it was those words that resonated in my heart that listening to him on television. Well, one of the things that Brother Copeland uh, has been teaching for years. If you know the story about Brother Copeland, he was walking on the Arkansas Riverbank and uh, the Lord spoke to him and said, I will hold you responsible for teaching the body of Christ the laws of prosperity. And so that was his mission. And honestly, having been around Brother Copeland, I, I have never... Now, do he and I agree on everything? No, we don't agree on everything. But be honest, I don't agree with me on everything. I, I mean, I, it'll be... Uh, it'll be a couple of years from now. I might watch one of these broadcasts and say, well, you know, I, I don't actually see it that way anymore because I'm still growing. So I'm not slamming him by saying that. He is still my spiritual father. I still honor his feet. And he is still, I believe he's going to receive fruit from everything this ministry is accomplishing all over the world. He's going to receive fruit off of this broadcast even. But here's the thing. Um, I've never met anybody that was more giving than him. Nobody. I, I've never seen, I, I mean, he literally paid every budget on a ministry that was getting millions of people saved a year. And he, he, he single-handedly paid their budgets. I mean, it was an amazing thing. He's given, he and Gloria have given to me personally and to my wife, and, and it, it's phenomenal. But when I came up under Brother Copeland, I was in what is commonly called the Word of Faith camp. And so I was learning a lot about faith, and I thank God I did. That's how I got healed of, of uh, sickness and disease and celiac sprue. It's how I came out of some situations. I thank God for that training. And I was there for, I guess, almost 17 years until the Lord started stirring something in me that He wanted to do some things in my life that I wasn't receiving there at that ministry. And that's not a slam. It'd be no different than if, if Jesus told you, listen, I, I let you, you, I, you, you've talked to Matthew, you spent some time with Matthew now, now I want you to go talk to John, and then, and, and then now I want you to go talk to Mark, and I want you to go talk to Luke. Uh, listen, there's, we shouldn't be unstable, but we should get different, there's different things that can be invested in us. And so for years I was in the Word of Faith camp. And so, but then something changed. I, the Lord started dealing with me about miracles, and He started dealing with me about some of those things. But then he also started dealing with me about lo his love and his grace. Now see, shortly thereafter, probably in 2003 maybe, I began on a journey studying about the grace of God and finding out the grace of God. And, and for me, it first was formulated in the love of God. And that's the reason that, I mean, we spent 30-something episodes, 35 episodes teaching about the love of God. But then I, I began to understand the grace of God. And I, now it's, when I'm shooting this, it's 2022. So I've spent nearly 20 years now, well really uh, probably 17, 18 years studying the grace of God. And for the last two years, 
I've been learning how to walk in them together. Because to be honest, as I got into grace, I was never one of those, you know, those knuckleheads that were bitter at word of faith. I'm very, very grateful. I still walk by faith. I still utilize those principles and things. I see them differently now that I understand grace. But then I got over here and began to study about the grace of God. And then it was not on the basis of performance, not, at least not my performance. It was based on the performance of the Lord Jesus. And so now for nearly the exact same amount of time, I studied grace. And then the Lord began to deal with me about when I got under grace that I began, began to become passive. And this has just been in the last two years. He, I mean, he had to correct me. He said, you've become too passive. You've become too laid back. You, you're not really walking in, in, in faith as much as you were in the beginning. And son, you got to put them both together. And, and, you know, obviously it says that in the word. So now as I begin to teach, to talk to you about tithing, I'm not, I'm really going to come out as best as I can right down the middle of the road. To understanding some things and, 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 and kind of maybe sharing these things with you. But you need to know whether tithing is in the New Testament and whether we should be doing it today. And you, you need to know that because it is a pretty foundational thing. And the way I want to start with this, if I could, I want to go to, uh, and, and let me also make this clear. Just because it's in the Old Testament does not make it under the law. Because I have people all the time say, well, that's, that's under the law. It, well, no, it's, it's before the law. And we're going to talk about some things that were before the law. Just because it sits in the Old Testament does not mean it is the law. You have to be very, very clear about that. So I, I want to look at, uh, first, when talking about tithing, I want to look at, at some principles. And listen, I'm not attacking anybody. But there are people out of, right there right now trying to talk you out of tithing. And again, I'm trying to, let's be clear about this. This is not to get money into this ministry because I don't want your tithes anyway unless you're one of those three groups. Okay? So this is not, this is not about me. This is not about Curdlin Ministries paying its bills. This isn't even really about partnership. This is about you so that you don't do something that's going to hurt you and that you are able to receive from God. And tithing is a part of that. And I'm going to prove it to you over the next couple of days. Now, this week, we're going, to, we're going to call this week Financial Keys Week. Now, part of that is, is because um, I'm going to be giving away uh, this book, Financial Keys. Okay, so uh, this is absolutely free. You can contact us. I'll kind of be explaining a little bit later on how to best utilize this book. Uh, our partners make this possible. If you um, now you can go on Amazon and buy it. I don't remember how much it is, but if you have need of this, we'll give it to you absolutely free. That's our partners make that possible. Now, let me just say this: if you are a partner, um, you do not have to request this. Uh, you should honestly have gotten one of these already. I try to uh, sign one of these for every partner because when somebody becomes a partner, I look at it as we're now in this ministry together and I want you to have something for me personally that says I, I value you, okay? And so I have to spend time every week signing books. Um, but the thing of it is, is that if you're a partner and you don't have your copy yet, go ahead and call in because I think it's important you get started on this right away and just say, hey, I'm a partner, but I haven't received my book yet. Would it be possible for you to get it out to me right away? So, but if you're not a partner, it doesn't matter. Contact the ministry uh, either on the number on your screen or go to our website at fighttowin.tv and we'll give this to you absolutely free. All right. Um, so, this is, so we're going to be talking about financial keys and that's going to be our offer. And I'm going to be talking about several different subjects this week. But we got to start with tithing. Okay, now I want you to look at this here in Genesis chapter uh, 2. And I want you to see something here. Um, this is after man has been created. And we're going to be down in verse um, 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in a garden, uh, in, in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Now notice here that man's got a job. Uh, one of the things I find interesting that people don't seem to understand sometimes 
on the grace. Well, you know, people that actually understand grace understand this, but the people who think they understand grace don't. Um, and listen, I get it because there's still stuff I think I understand that give me a little bit of time and I'm going to come back to you and say, I didn't, un didn't quite understand it, okay? So I'm not slamming you, but we need to be honest with ourselves where we're at. There are people that think they understand grace who think that there is absolutely no work involved in the Christian, Christian life at all. And listen, I agree with you. If any work you're taking is to get God to love you, to get God to accept you, to get God to bless you, those, those are works of the flesh and you need to cut that stuff out because what you're trying to do is build self-righteousness and you need to stop. You need to stop. Now, but that doesn't mean works stop, period. Because how do we know that? Because Adam had a job. Grace had provided everything for him. The day he was born, completely devoid of his own efforts, God had given him everything, absolutely freely. He did nothing to earn it. It was all on the basis of God's love and grace. And so he was created on the sixth day. They both rested on the seventh day, but they went back to work on the eighth day, <laughs> okay? Because he wasn't supposed to just sit under a tree and eat bonbons and watch stuff grow. He was supposed to, there was, a, there was a job for him to do. He was supposed to tend and keep the garden. Are you with me? So listen, I believe in the grace of God, but I'm still living in that eighth day where everything has provi been provided. I have entered into rest but I still have something that God is entrusting me, I must tend and keep. Okay? So, uh, again, it goes on here and he says this. He said, um, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. In the day you eat it, uh, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. Now, okay, here's something else that maybe some grace folks aren't going to like too much. Notice in this life of grace that Adam entered into, there were still some commandments he had to follow. <laughs> there were still some instruction from the Lord that he should heed. You feel me? Okay, I, 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 we'll talk about that later. But no, I want you to see this here because I want you to understand this principle. Adam, listen. You have a job. You must work the job. But I'm going to set this tree over there. Now that tree, he never said he didn't have to tend and keep the tree. He said he could never eat of the tree. In fact, it seems pretty clear in context, he was supposed to take care of all the trees, including this tree, but of that tree he would tend and keep, but he would not eat. In other words, in this, in this walk of grace, he must release his faith by saying, I'm going to work that tree, but as an honor and, and a joy towards the Lord, the one who has given me all things, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to work that tree, but I'm not going to eat of that tree. Now, you might be sitting there saying, I don't understand what you're saying. How does this have to do with tithing? Real simple. If you are fortunate enough to only work a 40-hour week, okay, there will be four hours of that week that you will work, but it should be set aside for God as an honor to Him. I honor the God who gave me this garden. I trust the God who gave me this garden. And therefore, I'm going to set aside the, this work I will work it, I will tend and keep it, but I will not eat of it. See, this principle has been around from the beginning, that there would be something that you would be set aside just for God, and you would do it simply because you loved and honored the one that gave you all things. And you would release your trust in Him by taking this action. Okay? See, it's... 
literally in the very beginning of the book. So this concept of working but not eating of that work has been from basically day one. Well, technically it's been day eight, but yeah. You see what I'm saying? Now, again, let's, let's go on here. Um, now we're going to go over to Genesis, and we're going to be in um, chapter 14. Now, in this story, Abraham has... There, okay, let me give you a little, bit back, a little bit of history, okay? Abraham and Lot split up, okay, because they were too blessed. So um, Lot, basically, he does not trust the blessing of God. He sees the well-watered ground, and he says, you know what, I'll take the good land. Well, I like what Abraham said. Listen, Lot, I'm blessed. Pick whatever ground you want because my future is secure because I'm blessed of God. Man, what trust is that? That is so awesome. And so Lot, being self-centered, looking after his own end, says, I'm going to take the well-watered ground, which is interesting as the story goes along because it's Abraham that stays, continues to prosper even with the rocky land, even with the land that was not well watered, he continued on because he trusted something other than the land to put him over. But maybe we'll cover that at a later time. But in the midst of this, Lot ends up living in downtown Sodom. Okay? This is before it gets toasted. All right? And there's these four kings who've been whipping everybody. And they, they, they've just been whipping everybody. In fact, they'd already whipped these other five kings. And so what happens is, is one day, though, they, they showed up in Sodom, and when they whipped Sodom, they took Lot, Abraham's nephew, with them. Well, you really shouldn't mess with people who have a covenant with God, especially people who know how to operate in it. So Abram, this old boy wasn't doing too bad, he takes 318 of his trained servants, not all of his servants, of his trained servants, people who had been trained to fight, and he goes and finds these four kings, and what five other kings couldn't do, Abram whoops them, right? He, he just, it's over for him. And he gets all of their stuff, right? He takes everything back, frees Lot, all that. There's so much more I could say about that story, but we're, we're running short on time. So he goes on here, and now he's on his way back. He's just whipped these four guys. He's got all this stuff, and now... There, he's headed back to take Lot home. Now, while he's headed back, in verse 18, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out the bread and the wine. He was priest of God Most High. Now, as we go along, people, there's a lot of people who think this was Jesus. This is the pre-incarnate Christ uh, there. Honestly, it doesn't say it. I don't know. I, I don't know everything, so I don't know. Um, and honestly, I don't care because it doesn't really change anything from what the Word is teaching here. It says, Then Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out the bread and the wine. Now, that should seem familiar to, if you've been going to church for any length of time. The bread and the wine. The body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And he says, um, or the communion meal. He was priest of God Most High. Now, this is a little weird of a bit of a story if you think about it because Abram's headed back to Sodom and this guy just shows up. <laughs> He's like, he wanted, hi, how you doing, Abe? Uh, uh, the Lord's told me about you and uh, I, my name's Mel Kizadek. You can call me Mel and um, I'm priest of God Most High. Okay, I, I don't know that he really said call, call him Mel, but I would have asked to call him Mel. I would have said, hey, can we cut this short because Mel Kizadek, it's kind of a long name, but. Moving right along. So this, this priest of God Most High goes out to this man who had been promised blessing to be blessed. And it says, and he, he blessed him saying, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High who has delivered your enemies into your hands. Now, here's something interesting about this. Um... Abram, up to this point, he had been told, you will be blessed, you will be blessed, you will be blessed, you will be blessed. There's a change here. Melchizedek does not say God will bless you. He says you are blessed. 
Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. Now, he goes on here and he says this. He gave him a tithe of all. So, okay, and just to kind of, I've only got a few more minutes here to kind of tell you what happens. Abram's about to give all this stuff away. He's about to, this, he is giving a tithe off of, some, off of something he's not even going to keep. He, when this priest of God Most High shows up and brings the bread and the wine. Now, I want you to think about this from God's side. God thought it was important enough to receive this tithe that he sent a man out there specifically to get it. This is evidently important to God. This receiving of the bread and the wine, the receiving of the tithes, and the pronouncing of the blessing. Evidently, this is important enough to God that this guy just shows up out of nowhere to receive it. That, that to me, tells God's intention in this and His desire in this. But Abraham, a man not under the law, even though it's Old Testament, he is under absolutely no law at all. He gives him a tithe of all. He takes 10% of this and honors God with it. He believes. When Melchizedek says you are blessed, Abram believes him. And see, this tithe is not coming out of I want to be blessed. This tithe is coming out of the fact I actually believe God has blessed me. Now we're going to get more into this tomorrow. There is so much in here. Now I want you to remember everything we've talked about so far, not a single bit of it is, is the law. It is Old Testament, but it is not the law. This, in, in Abraham, you've got to remember, is the father of our faith. Now in just a few minutes, I, I have a couple things I want to share with you. And we'll cut to that in just a second. But when I come back, I want to pray with you over your finances. I want to pray with you over your revelation. And I want to pray with you over your opportunities this year. Because I believe regardless of what's going on in the economy, if you live according to your trust in God. Remember how Abraham did not trust the, the land to put him over? He trusted God. I believe you can be the same way. Come right back. I want to pray with you. Are you tired of your financial miracle never showing up? In this life-transforming devotional, you will discover practical help to see your God-given increase. Order online at fighttowin.tv. Lord, I thank you that you are giving them revelation knowledge of your word and revelation knowledge of tithing. Lord, not because I said it, but because your word says it. Lord, I thank you that exactly as Isaiah says, that you are the Lord that is teaching them to profit, leading them in the way that they should go. And Lord, I thank you that this year they will experience profit and not loss in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Praise God. Well, come back tomorrow. we got some exciting things. This is Kurt Owen reminding you to fight to win and Jesus is risen. Victory is assured.